Luke chapter 24 this morning. The Lord was in that grave three days and three nights. I promise not to keep you that long. Amen. Uh, aren't you glad this morning he arose? Thank God for that. Amen. Resurrection Sunday morning. I'm just I'm going to read uh, 12 verses here out of the book of Luke chapter number 24. And I've got a lot of notes, but we're just going to cover what we need to. But anyway, I, I thank God this morning, listen, for being saved. Amen. Amen. November 1976, on a Sunday night, sitting on the back pew of a church. Never forget, I found myself lost without God. I asked God to forgive my sin and ask Christ to be my Savior. I have... I have done a poor job, but I've tried to live for God ever since. Amen. I thank the Lord for that. If you're here and don't know Jesus Christ this morning, I just want to tell you He loves you. You've been the only man, only woman, every child, only child that ever lived. Christ would have died in your place. That's how personal this thing is. Amen. Get to Luke chapter number 24. I had several Gospels to pick uh, uh, from. But I chose this for a reason this morning. I run begin reading verse number one. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. Now, Christ has been in that grave, that body, for three days and three nights. Not from Friday until Sunday. There's no good Friday found in the Bible. Uh, he was crucified on a Wednesday. The next, that was a preparation for the Sabbath, which was in high day, the Bible said, as one of their feasts. So they couldn't do anything with the body on Thursday. Friday was a preparation for the normal Sabbath. They couldn't do anything for the body. So they came three days later. The Bible said as uh, Jonas was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights. He said, the Son of Man be in the bowels of the earth. So we find it's been three days now, very early in the morning. Now, on the first day of the week, they can come take care of the body the way the Jews do. Verse number two, they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. They entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass as they were much perplexed thereabout. Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and the third day rise again. They remembered his words and returned from the sepulcher, and told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. And their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. Then arose Peter, ran unto the sepulcher, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves, and departed wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. This morning's what we call Resurrection Sunday morning. Amen. Up from the grave he arose. I thank God for that this morning. Matthew said it this way, He is not here, for he is risen as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. Once again this morning, you'll find the garden tomb still empty. Always will be empty. I thank God for that. I thank God for the resurrection. The resurrection is one of what we call a cardinal doctrine of the Word of God. Got a lot. Of, the Bible is a doctrinal book, but it, we deal with some things that are cardinal doctrines. That means they're fundamental. That means they are basic. They're principle. They're, they're things that we need to really hang on to in the day in which we live. And I thank the Lord for that. So I want to look just for a few minutes at the resurrection. But the resurrection did two things. One, the resurrection ended something. And then the resurrection began something. It finished something. When he rose from the grave, it finished something. 
And then it started something new on the other side. And I want to deal with both of those just for a moment this morning. The resurrection was a finishing to what's called the gospel. Now most of you here understand the gospel. The gospel, that word gospel means good news. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Let me read what 1 Corinthians said about it. They gave a tremendous definition Chapter 15, verse number 1 through 4, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. So we find three things there. One, the preaching of the gospel. The foolishness of the gospel to the world. But the gospel is salvation to everyone that believeth. That's the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection was the capstone that finished something. Now listen to what he said. I preached it. You received it. Have you received it this morning? That Jesus Christ died for your sins on the cross of Calvary, paid the price. They buried him in a sepulcher. They put him in a sepulcher. And the third day he arose from the dead. It's called the gospel. Matter of fact, he said this, By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, lest you believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. Before a man preaches the gospel, the man needs to have received the gospel. You know, you've got a lot of men that get in pulpits, they wouldn't know Jesus Christ if he sat down beside of them. They've never been saved. They've been baptized and joined the church someplace and grew up in church and decided one day that they wanted to be a preacher and they got in the pulpits, but they've never received the foundation of the gospel itself. So Paul said this. He said, I delivered, first of all, what I received, how Christ, one, died for our sins according to the Scripture. He didn't swoon up there. Matter of fact, he bowed his head and he died. Three of the last words that Christ said on the cross was he said, it is finished. A finished product. Now, he was going to finish it here, but he finished the payment for sin. And God the Father accepted that payment. The Bible said that he is declared to be God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So Christ died for our sins, that He was buried, and then that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So we find the Gospel. The Gospel is found in these verses here. If you will just look on down, he, he talks about the gospel all through here. How that Christ died for the sins of the whole world, according to our scripture. He, he was buried in a garden tomb. He was there for three days and he was there for three nights. Then Christ rose again the third day according to the scripture. That was the acceptance of God that the price had been paid, one, in full, and two, in a right manner. You go to Isaiah chapter 52, Isaiah chapter 53. The Bible said that God saw the travail of His soul and was satisfied. He was satisfied with it. Later we find the presentation of the blood. You say, where's the blood today? The blood is there on the mercy seat in heaven. So what happened here, He... He finished something when he rose from the grave. What did he? The gospel. If Christ had not risen from the dead, we would have no gospel. If Christ hadn't died for the sinners, we'd still be in our sin. We understand that. Paul dealt with that in another matter. Paul said that if we have uh, faith in Christ uh, in this world only, he said, we are of all men most miserable. You know, if there is nothing beyond this life, then we would be better today to be somewhere fishing. We'd do better today to go out and make money on Sunday because you get paid time and a half or double time. We'd be better to be someplace else. Hey, I thank God this morning we're right where we need to be. 
Because there's a finishing to this thing. This thing is a sealed deal, as we would say in our day. That Christ died for sinners, that they buried him, that he resurrected the third day, and God accepted what he did. So it finished something, but it also began something. The resurrection started something in our lives. I thank God that it started something for me. I was 28 when I got saved. I'd been there, done that. Had a, had a closet full of t-shirts. I'd been to college. I'd been overseas in the military and come back and 28-year-old man, we were out of church. Nobody, nobody really came to visit us. Nobody cared about us. I don't know if anybody prayed for us or not. Barbara and I uh, had been married for several years uh, by that time and we were just out of it. But I thank God that I know today that Christ died for my sin. I thank God for that. And I'm glad that he was buried and thank God he rose again. So no grave going to keep this body down. You go out here to the cemetery, that's a resurrection ground. You do not live without purpose. Evolution teaches you that you're just an accident that happened. Now, I've got news for them. We've got plans beyond this life. I hope you've got plans because everybody here is an eternal soul. When God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, he breathed the life of God itself into him. We're going to live somewhere forever. So the gospel opens something up. It begins something for us. I give my testimony a lot because my life began at age 28. Had a starting point. Amen. Tell you about a time, take you to a place where the Lord saved me by His marvelous grace. My wife got a brand new husband. Our people hear this all the time. I thank God she got a brand new husband. I came home from that church that night and God was dealing with my heart. God was changing my heart. And boy, I thank the Lord. So we find not only a finishing of something, but we find a beginning of a new life in Jesus Christ. The resurrection gives a believer hope in eternity. I have no fear of death this morning. Death is just simply a door through which one day I will step into the eternal presence of God. The Bible said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's the same time of him. When you uh, die here, you're home one way or the other, all right? You're either in heaven you're, or you're in hell. These are two places. People say, why did God made hell? Because heaven, most people wouldn't like it anyway. They wouldn't enjoy heaven. Heaven's going to be rejoicing and praising God and spend eternity with the Lord. Amen. But we find not only a finishing of something, but a start of something. Without the resurrection of Christ, Calvary would have been in vain. We'd still be in our sins. There'd be no hope for life everlasting. Without the resurrection, no finishing of the gospel. No finishing of the cross. I'm glad this morning that he paid one time forever and that's over with. Amen. When he said it's finished, he said into thy hands I commend my spirit. And he bowed his head and dismissed his spirit because death had no claim on Christ. Christ was born different from us. Virgin born. The Son of God. We find in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 again, if in this life we have hope in Christ, if it's only in this, we are all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam... All die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Do you know this morning where you're going to spend your eternity? It's a question we often ask. Do you know where you're going to... Hey, and by the way, you can know where you're going when you die. It's not a maybe thing. It's not a hope so thing. It's an assurity that God gives to His children that one of these days, thank God. Hey... I'm talking about I've got hope this morning. 
Without hope, we'd have nothing. The resurrection gives the believer confidence in life. I thank the Lord I live a different life today. I, and this is not about me. I want you to understand. I, the only reason I give a personal illustration is because I can't give yours. The Bible says it's faith to faith. I, I, am, I this morning, am an example of faith that works. The Bible says you believe there's one God. The Bible says you do well. The devils also believe and tremble. A lot of people say they believe in God, but they have no faith in Christ. I thank God this morning. Hey, I'm talking about it gives me confidence in my life this morning. Paul said it this way over in the book of Philippians, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or death. For to me to live is Christ. So it's not just a hope there. But thank God it's a hope here. Salvation is a changing life experience. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. When you got saved, did the old things pass away? When you got saved, did everything become new? Not that we're perfect this morning. I'm not a perfect man. But I thank God that my sins have been taken care of, past, present, and future, and I can live my life, and I want to live my life for Jesus Christ. I, I count it all joy this morning to be able to live for Jesus Christ. Listen, it's a thrill. People say, that's a boring life. Oh, no, that's an exciting life. Amen. I thank God. I get up in the morning, and I'm ready to roll. I'm ready to go. My body doesn't want to go, but I want to go. You know, mentally, I'm still just a kid. <laughs> Physically, I'm a little bit older, all right? I'm getting on up there. Somebody used to say, I'm getting a little bit long in the tooth. I'm getting older. I'll be 76 years old in about 30 days, 35 days, something like that. May the 15th. Hey, thank God. Hey, and I'm good with that this morning. Amen. I'm good with it. Listen, I'm as excited about living today as I have ever been in my life. God has placed that in there. So we're talking about not just a hope in heaven, and it's not a hope I'm going to heaven. Thank God I'm going. But listen, I thank God I get to live for Jesus Christ and try to make a difference in this world. Amen. The Bible said to let your light shine. Let people see your good works that they might see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Life is not about us. You know what gets people in trouble this morning? They think life is all about them. Life is not like it. There's a little acrostic. Most of you know what that is, and it's the word joy. Very simple. You put Jesus first. Oh, you put others second. And why you put you last. And if you do that, you're going to have a lot happier life than you are. We live in days where people are so self-centered. They think the whole universe revolves around their life. I mean, it's what I want. Doesn't matter what you think. Doesn't matter what I do. I'll do what I want to, and you've got no business in my business. My business is everybody's business. Found out a long time ago, the world doesn't revolve around me. It revolves around Jesus Christ. And then it revolves around others. So we find it gives us confidence in life. What's it talking about? That everything's going to be all right. But it also gives the believer that peace in death. I dealt with that a few minutes ago. Death is simply a door. It's like this door over here. That door is death. You're living this life here. You simply step out of this life into the other one when you go through that door. As it is appointed unto men once to die, the Bible, hey, listen, if Jesus doesn't come soon, I'm going to die. My body's getting older, and one of these days I'm going to lay down and I'm going to tell this world goodbye. And I'll step out of this body, and for the first time, 
I'll finally be home. This world's not my home anymore. I look around. America's gone to pot. The world's going to pot. Everything's going to pot out here. And the evolutionists tell you everything's getting better, elevating to a higher plane. But I'll tell you what, they better take a good look at humanity. Humanity is de-elevating. They're, they're going down this way. There's a song we sing sometime, and the words say change and decay in all around I see. What we see today is decay. Don't want to get into entropy, but at the same time, everything in a closed system tends to decay, not to get better, but to decay. So we find that it gives peace in death. David said it this way, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. There's three things it takes to make a shadow. One, you've got to have a light. Then you've got to have an object. And then it gives a reflection. I've got a shadow this morning. I look down the light, the object, and there's the place of reflection, which is my shadow. The Bible talks about death being the shadow of death. The light is the Word of God. The object is hell itself, which is the second death. And thank God we just walk through the shadow underneath, and shadows don't hurt people. So I'm talking about... It gives peace this morning. Jesus said it this way. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Over in Revelation 14, the Bible said, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. So we find the resurrection doing several things. It also gives us this morning boldness in our witness. Boldness in our witness. I thank God that what I'm telling people works. You ever had somebody try to sell you something that doesn't work? That, hey, that's the way a lot of people make their living. Telemarketers, how in the world they get my wife's cell phone number? We don't give her cell phone number out. Somebody did. So we get all these calls from all these numbers. Did you know that I have actually had my cell phone call me four times? My number has called me four times. Anybody else had that happen? Yep, there's some others. My number is 864-684-7747. Phone rings, I look, and there's my telephone number. What they did, they, they have scrambled these numbers so that you can't block them. If you do, you're going to block yourself or somebody else, and they just keep on calling. Now, I don't know what they're selling. I wish they would get a legitimate job. 9.30 on a Sunday night is not when I want to hear a telemarketer. I got one calls me all the time. Beep. He says, David? Huh? Got that same boy. Hey, this is not a recording. It's, this guy is live. My wife picked it up not long ago, and he said, Dave. She said hello in her little soft feminine voice, and he said, David. And she said, do I sound like David to you? you know, I, 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 that's the way, hey, I, you say, well, how do you get rid of them? Give them the gospel. Just tell them, before you say anything, I want you to listen. I've got, I've got the first five to ten minutes. Boy, they hang up on you real quick. I don't know what they're selling. They sell a lot of things that don't work. Sometimes they sell you something that should work that don't work. You ever bought something brand new and got it home and had to take it back to Walmart or wherever because it didn't work? And you want the product, so what you do, you have to trade it in on another one and take it home to find out if it worked. And about the third time, you look for something else to buy. We bought a brand new car one time. Didn't have 20 miles on it, I don't guess. We started going to Kentucky. We pulled out at 2 o'clock in the morning, got out on I-26, and the lights went out. We had to sit about four hours in the dark until it got to where we could drive. And on a brand new vehicle, the light switch was bad. Hey, you can buy things that are bad. 
What I'm giving to somebody is something that I know that worked. So what I'm doing, I'm giving them what I got. Not what somebody else told me to give them. I'm giving them something that works. The resurrection gives us a boldness in our witness. That this thing works. Thank the Lord for that. Paul said this, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel will change your life forever. You won't be perfect here, but I thank God one day this sinful body will be gone and I'll get one without the sin and I'll be perfect up there. The Bible said one of these days we shall be like Him for we shall see Him as He is. And I thank God for that. So it gives us boldness in our witness. Paul said in 2 Timothy, For the which cause I also suffer these things. You'll suffer in this life if you're a Christian or non-Christian. Life's hard. And until you get that, you're going to be disappointed in life. The Bible said it rains on the just. rains on the unjust. My neighbor probably gets as much rain as I get. He probably gets more than I get. We live in a dry section. I believe the road's the divider, and he gets more rain across the road than I get on my side. Bad things happen to good people. Good things happen to bad people. Neither one of them stay that way. You find a reversal. But this is what he said. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom, not what. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. The gospel now is the finishing by the resurrection. So he did one thing here. He finished. He finished what he started. Thank God for people that finish what they start. And if you're saved, you need to finish well. Paul said, I've fought a good fight. Finished my course. Kept the faith. We sang a little while ago, Because He Lives. I thank God this morning that because He lives, I live also. I thank God because He lives. I'm going to live forever with Him. When He comes back, one of these days, and listen, He's coming. He said, and if I go away, I will come again and receive you unto Myself. But He made a statement that where I am, you say, what's heaven? Heaven's mansions. I thank God for them. I really do. We're going to have a wonderful place to live. In my Father's house are many mansions. Not rooms, not a little cabin over in the corner of glory land someplace. The Bible said, listen, I've been in built more and built more wouldn't make a good outhouse in heaven. I've got a place to live. But he said heaven was where I am. I thank God one day I'm going to spend eternity with the one who died in my place for my sin. Every sin you've ever committed has already been paid for. There's not one sin that was committed by anybody in here that was not paid for. You say then we're all going to heaven. No. I could go to Spartanburg up here and buy you a plane ticket that would take you all the way to Hawaii and pay it in full. Brother Charlie used to, he'd be up there to make sure he got on the plane right. But you'll never go to Hawaii until you get on that plane. You've got to be saved. Born again. Repentance from sin and faith toward God. It is so simple that a child can be saved this morning. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all fear is gone. Because I know, I know He holds my future. Life is worth the living just because He lives. And then one day, 
I'll cross that river. I'll fight life's final war with pain, and then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory, and I'll know he lives. Amen. Christ paid for your sin completely. Let's stand this morning. We're going to have an invitation if you need to come. While the musicians come, there's a little thing that says this, life is short, death is sure, sin the cause, Christ is the cure. While they play.